Welcome to the digital lecture series of FU Best, the European Studies Program of Freie Universität Berlin. In 15 sessions, we will offer you a broad overview of FU Best's academic course offerings. You can choose from 12 subject course lectures representing a wide range of disciplines and three live sessions on German language and culture. Our series is divided into four themes relevant to European studies in Berlin and Germany today. Each will be dealt with by a group of FO best instructors from the perspectives of their particular disciplines or German language levels. Part 2 explores a range of concurrent national and personal identities in present-day Europe, Germany and Berlin. We will look at Germany's political role or roles in Europe, the interplay of religion and of popular culture with the identities of specific groups of Germans and the meaning of art for the creation of a national identity in Europe. All sessions will offer you insights into our instructors' semester-long regular courses within the FOBES program and the way in which they integrate Berlin as a cultural and historical location. We hope you enjoy the online program we've assembled for you. For more details about the lecture series and our regular on-site FBS program, visit our website later. You will also find additional information at the end of today's lecture. With that, enjoy the following session and see you soon in Berlin. Welcome to my lecture, Multicultural Berlin, the Dynamics of Muslim Cosmopolitanism. My name is Fatih Abai. I'm an anthropologist and I'm teaching at FU Best for the last five years the course Islam in Europe Historical and Contemporary Dimensions. I graduated from University Maastricht in the Bachelor in European Studies and did my Master's at Central European University in Political Science. Currently I'm enrolled at the Europa Universität Viadrina Frankfurt Oder in the Social cultural anthropology and doing my PhD on the dissertation of secular liberal Muslims in Germany. As the last years I become an expert on issues such as Islam in Europe, migration and religion in the modern world. I taught various courses at Europa University Viadrina, Humboldt University at, and Freie Universität Berlin uh, on issues such as Islam, migration, secularism, and gender. I want to now start, first of all, by introducing my course, Islam in Europe, Historical and Contemporary Dimensions. The learning objectives for this class are the following. First of all, I want to introduce the prospective students, the history of Islam and the foundations of Islam as a religion. Secondly, I want to study different approaches with my students uh, to study Islam and Muslims that try to explain the various discourses, practices and conditions of Muslims living in Europe. The course intends to train to form and express arguments during scholarly debates in courts and, and to articulate complex thoughts during an in-class presentation. The course will train my prospective students to read, capture and employ theoretical approaches in the field of social studies, specific in the study of Islam as a religion. It should also improve my students' skills for ethnographic research and essay writing in the field of social studies, specifically in the anthropology of religion. So, what I want to do now it's the beginning of my presentation. I want to actually sketch the foundations of Islam as it is very crucial to understand the basic nuances of Islam as a religion. Uh, in order to do that, I will first give some demographic facts over the Muslim population living in the world. So, according to current numbers, there are an estimated 1.2 billion Muslims living worldwide. Only 18% of this number are living in the Arab world, 
meaning the Arab Peninsula. 20% of this number of, of Muslims living worldwide are living in Sub-Saharan Africa and 30% are living in South Asia. So the world's largest single Muslim communities, you can find the top 10 of these single Muslim largest communities, you can find in countries like Indonesia, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Nigeria, Egypt, Iran, Turkey, Algeria, and Sudan. It is here very important to actually uh, see and to note that on, among these top 10 of single Muslim, of the top largest single Muslim living communities in the world, no country from the Arab world is present. So it basically shows us that Islam is not only a religion which can be just reduced to the Arab world, but it has to be think also more globally because the processes of the uh, global spread of religion, but also through processes such as migration. And here we come actually to the topic of Europe, because in Europe, Islam is a migrated religion. I will come to this later again when I'm talking more about Europe and Islam specifically. So just for the foundations of Islam, it is here very important that Islam is actually divided in two main branches today, the Sunni and the Shia. It is actually here equivalent to the categorization of two branches within Christianity, namely Catholic and Protestant. The Sunni and the Shia are actually uh, two branches which are kind of uh, uh, very similar when it comes to the religious practices in Islam. They differ when it comes to the belief who should be actually the Prophet Muhammad's uh, direct descendant. The Sunni recognize the male heirs of the first four elected caliphs after Muhammad's death. The Shia recognize the descendants of only the fourth caliph, who's Ali, the only two descendant of the Prophet Muhammad. So what is here important is actually not that there is no division between good Muslims and bad Muslims, which is very, very always the falsely reported in the media. Uh, let's say the Sunni are the bad Muslims and the Shia are the progressive modern Muslims. But it's actually uh, the religious practices of Sunni and Shia Muslims are actually the same, only it comes to the belief of the succession of the prophets of succession, which actually differs these two branches. The majority of Muslims today are Sunni Muslims. They encompasses like 70% of the Muslim population worldwide. 20% of the population worldwide are Shia Muslims and 10% uh, belong to other Islamic sects. So the Sunni Muslims are worldwide more present in the single Muslim, as a single Muslim community in various countries. Uh, it's maybe here to note that only two main countries are basically dominantly uh, populated by Shia Muslims, that is Iran and Iraq. And here, of course, it's very interesting to see that Iran, who now, after uh, the Islamic Revolution in that country, after the Shah regime, actually is one of the most ultra-Orthodox Muslim countries in the world. It's here important, actually, in Islam that we understand also the basic principles of that religion. First of all, 
we, I want to talk here shortly about the Prophet. The Prophet Muhammad, actually, who was born in Mecca and who actually then later went to Medina, the other most the holy important city in Islam, uh, to get actually followers after his revelation through God, which he actually experienced and received when he was around 40 years. We don't really know much today about Muhammad's life before the Islamic revelation, but we can just say that he's actually coming from a like peasant class and peasant family. So his family was a nomad family. He was born in Mecca and then he married actually to his wife Hatija, who became, who was a member of the higher class of merchants in Mecca. And he, it's also here important to note that Muhammad himself was illiterate, meaning that the revelation through God in the, in the appearance of Archangel Gabriel actually is completely an oral revelation. Meaning, after he revealed these, this prophecy of the only true God, Muhammad actually went to his wife and close friends and they actually started to write this revelation down. And that's actually how the holy book of Quran actually became today's book of Quran. Very important difference between the Prophet Muhammad and, let's say, the Christian Prophet Jesus, is that Muhammad was a mortal man, so he was never divine, and so he, albeit he had extraordinary qualities and preached a strong social justice message about quality and poverty among his people. But it's not like in Christianity, for example, where Jesus is seen to believe uh, or is believed to be God's son, that in this way, actually, Muhammad is completely a mortal man. It is here important that, that until today, there is no depiction of the Prophet Muhammad seen. Me, because he himself forbade, actually, his own depictions of himself in order to avoid iconization of the prophet. For example, in Christianity, we can see in Christian churches that there's a lot of like depictions of Jesus and of the Bible in various very nice artistic work, but these kind of depictions of the prophet do not exist in Islam. So I want actually to now here stretch on the five pillars of Islam and these are actually the foundations of the Islamic belief today. First of all, it's belief itself. So it's very easy for a Muslim to become actually a member of the Muslim community just to basically confess to the belief of Islam. And in this sense, it's also very important for an individual who wants to convert to Islam to become, uh, to con to become a member of the Muslim community by actually confessing to the belief of Islam. The second important pillar is actually the pillar of worship. So here it is very important that we actually note that Muslims today are praying five times and this praying circle of worship is actually organized according to the moon, meaning here also according to the times of sun, of the sun uh, touching the earth. 
That's why Muslims are praying dawn, noon, afternoon, evening and night for these different prayers. It's also here important that Friday is the holy day in Islam, where as equivalent to the Saturday in Judaism or to Sunday in Christianity, the Friday is actually the most holy day in Islam, where specifically in big mosques and in cities, men are gathering for the common Friday prayer, where the Imam, who is actually the authority of the mosque, is preaching on these Friday prayers. The third pillar of Islam is fasting. Fasting is a practice always in the month of Ramadan, and a Muslim is actually or should fast in order to feel compassion with the people who are poor, who don't have daily needs to basics like nutrition, water, and other luxuries. So in this month, it's very important for a Muslim to also cleanse the body. And here, it is very important uh, to note that a Muslim is fasting from sunrise, meaning dawn, till sunset. In this time, he or she is not allowed to drink, to eat, or to have any kind to smoke or to sexual uh, encounters uh, with uh, the other gender or with another individual. The fourth pillar of Islam is the alms tax, meaning charity. Here it's very important that Islam make principles of social justice and about quality and poverty are basically here also practice in the practice of the arms tax. So the arms tax actually says that each Muslim is actually obliged to give to one third of its own fortune to any kind of human being who is in need uh, and who is actually poor, so who is in need of material help. The fifth pillar, which is the last pillar of Islam, is the pillar of pilgrimage. Here, during the month of Hajj, it's very crucial that each Muslim is actually going on a pilgrimage to the holy city of Mecca to see actually the Kaaba, which is the main uh, house of God in today's Islam. During the month of Hajj, most people go also to, not only to Mecca, but also to Medina. Medina being the second most important holy city in Islam, where actually Muhammad is buried. The third holy city of Islam, which also can be visited uh, during other pilgrimages, is Jerusalem. Jerusalem being actually the first city where the direction of praying, of worship, was actually directed to before this direction was changed to the Kaaba where act in, Mid in Mecca. Uh, so now being Mecca the most holy and important city in Islam and it's also the city uh, in which direction all Muslims are praying to. So just to basically give uh, additional information about the pillar of worship, praying, it's important that all Muslims pray in Arabic language. So all the prayers in these different cycles at different times of the day are actually cited in Arabic language. 
So Arabic here being the main language, important language of Islam, because it's also the language in which, of course, the holy book of Quran is written to. The Quran, just here as an important note, is kind of the same, has the same size as the Gospels, so as the Bible, and it's actually continuing these biblical stories uh, and actually tell them about what to do or not to do as a Muslim. He also, as an important note for the foundations of Islam, is that Islam is also here considered to be an Abrahamic religion, meaning that the overall prophet is here Abraham, and that um, or the founding father of these religions is Abraham, and but that Islam is here actually differing in that way because it's basically continuing um, the stories of Christianity and Judaism, and here having Judaism, Christianity, and then Islam as these three succeeding Abrahamic religions, it's very here important that actually to note that Islam here is actually also following and believing in the books of the Gospels, of the Torah, of the Prophets, and of the angels, of the other two religions. So in Islam, angels, archangels, like Gabriel, Michael, and Raphael, and play a big role as well, as of course the prophets like Jesus and Moses. Jesus, for example, is mentioned in the Quran 73 times, but the only difference in Islamic belief is that Jesus was never crucified. So we have actually here the same traditions and beliefs of the Abrahamic religions in Islam. So now I want first to basically start with the theoretical concepts of this course. And the main concept, one of the main concepts we will deal about in this course is secularism. Secularism, coming from the word Latin word seculum, secular, means here worldly non-religious, not belonging to a religious order. It also encompasses the idea of freedom of religion, and it gives also the idea of equal citizenship to each citizen, regardless of his or her religion. And secularism defines the separation of religion and state. Well, in today's world, we can see, especially in the Western world, we can see a lot of countries who have this tradition and the idea of secularism in its own doctrine, but each country kind of deals differently with the aspect of religion. For example, Germany has the idea of secularism defined and embodied in its constitution, but still the German government or German politics and also German society are very in this way religiously influenced. For example, that most German citizens are still paying taxes to the church or that the church or politics are influencing certain values of certain political parties. The other big extreme case in Europe is France. France being the only country in Western Europe, or in Europe in that sense, to have the idea of laicite, meaning here the clear separation of religion and state, meaning here the clear separation of religion and politics, and that religion is completely banned out of, out of the public sphere. 
Secularization is very important for Europe and also for the Western idea and Western world today when it comes to the relationship with religion in the modern world. One of the founders of the secularization thesis is the sociologist Max Weber. For him, the secularization thesis is actually comprised of three main components. First, the structural differentiation of social spheres resulting in separation of religion from politics. Second, the privatizing of religion, meaning religion has no big significance role in the public space, and the decreasing social significance of religion as well. In this course, we will actually deal with the idea of secularism, and we will look how secularism is actually impacting also Muslim and Muslim life in Western or in Europe. It's also important that we will deal with new theories of secularism by other main theorists who actually kind of refine or critique the secularization thesis. Notably to mention here Charles Taylor, Jose Casanova and Talal Assad. The second important theoretical concept for this course is the concept given by Edward Said, namely Orientalism. Here it's important to define first Orientalism as a Western view of what the West defined as the Orient. And for you as prospective students of my course, it's very important to know about this concept because it's actually also a concept which helps us to open our wide lenses in studying Islam and Muslims in Europe, but also in, globally in the world. Orientalism refers to a European perspective determined by the relationship between power and knowledge, the colonial invasion of European nations, the imperialist development of Europe, and the rise of studies and specialists in European universities about the Orient. Orientalism separates and ranks the world into two poles, the West, above the East, producing the Orient as an object of analysis. Orientalism entails the creation of a preconceived image of the Orient as an exotic, fascinating and threatening place. The Orientals are also categorized as a timeless people who do not change and are blindly attached to their traditions. The third concept important here in this course is the concept I want to introduce here is cosmopolitanism, as mentioned in the title. So cosmopolitanism is first here very important, the idea that all human beings are or could or should members of a single community. The different views of that constitutes this community may include a focus on moral standards, economic practices, political structures, and or cultural forms. The philosopher Kramer Appiah suggests the possibility of a cosmopolitan community in which individuals from varying locations, physical, economic, enter relationships of mutual respect despite their different beliefs, religious, political, and so on. It's also important, as he stresses, that various places are called here maybe cosmopolitan, this does not usually mean cosmopolitan in that sense. So cosmopolitan means people of various ethnic, cultural, and religious backgrounds live nearby and interact with each other. This is actually also what you can see and will observe when you come to Berlin as an important site of studying Islam, but also of studying multiculturalism. So it's here important uh, to maybe here introduce Berlin first uh, uh, as a multicultural city because it's a city where it has different, especially in the last years, experienced different waves of migration. The Islamic presence in Germany and in Berlin is very, very uh, visible due to these different waves of migration after the second, beginning after the second world. It started first with the Turkish guest worker movement, 
but then also with new movements from the uh, Bosnian or former Yugoslavian uh, from region, the Balkan, so meaning Bosnians arrived to uh, with during the guest worker movement, the Turkish migration, which is the biggest Turkish uh, Muslim population in Germany, uh, arrived. And then later, during the 90s, Arab Muslim population arrived during political crises, for example, in Lebanon or in the Near East. And now the latest Muslim migration movement is the one with the refugee movement from Syria. So you have now the majority of Muslims in Berlin are actually of Turkish, Bosnian, Arab and Syrian descent. It's here important to study Berlin as an important site of Islam because you find a lot of transnational Islamic communities that led to different community building within the Muslim diaspora meaning you have a kind of global Islam. I use here the word global as a combination of global and local, because the globalization of Islam is very present in Berlin due to this very strong transnational ties with the home country of that specific Muslim community. So you have a Turkish Islam, an Arab Islam, and a Bosnian Islam present and living its practices in Germany. And of course today there are big discussions and there are also of course discourses. So what, what actually a German Islam makes specific? And we can actually say that these kind of transnational Islamic communities who adapt to certain Western values and uh, in Germany, but also to adapt to uh, the social and democratic values of Germany, actually kind of combine their transnational, translocal or global um, Islam with German values of democracy, secularism, and liberalism. So we can see here in Berlin the different types of communities due to different interpretation of Islam. And we see, of course, here the different dichotomies within any religious community like Judaism and Christianity. Here is mainly seeing the dichotomies of traditional versus modern, pious versus secular liberal, orthodox versus progressive, and Islam here presents uh, the landscape of Islamic communities. Now I want first of all to sketch these current debates on Islam in Western Europe, which are very predominant, especially since 9-11. So participation of Muslim actors within the public space is always one of these big debates. And we can see it, of course, in different types of religious practices, but also in different types of uh, um, presence of Muslims in Europe. The most common debate on Islam in Europe is the debate about veiling and the headscarf debate. The headscarf, as you can see here also, also on the image, is one of the main visible, but also of the main discussed religious symbols in Islam. Especially women who are confidently wearing the headscarf as a Muslim woman uh, are unfortunately a lot also under Western discussions of oppression and inequality and so the headscarf became here a very big, not only religious symbol, but also political symbol in the last years. Veiling became here very, very important as a discourse in Europe. And various governments 
in Western Europe actually issue different laws on restricting uh, and even banning the headscarf out of the public space. France, being one of the first countries in Europe, banned the headscarf in already 2003. Secondly, then the burqa, which is the Muslim full body coverage, which you can see in the depictions of uh, Afghani women, uh, mostly they were associated with the Taliban, but uh, it's basically the whole full body covering of the woman, became also banned here in countries like France, Belgium, Netherlands, and other countries. Germany, for example, still did not really have a clear rule on the regulation of headscarf ban or Boca ban, but uh, there are basically federal countries or federal regions of Germany issuing the ban in, in their regions on different levels. I will come later to the Berlin example more in detail. Then the second big debate is the mosque construction. We had years ago the um, public decision of Switzerland as a country actually, and it was actually uh, held in a referendum, to ban minarets as uh, buildings or ban minarets from Switzerland. So there's no mosque, mosque construction in the classical form of mosques construction uh, possible in Switzerland. Then one of the most important debates is gender. And not only related to the aspect of veiling and headscarf, but also to the idea of feminism, equal rights of women, and also to uh, sexual orientation like homosexuality in Islam. So it's important to have these kind of debates in Islam, for sure, and there are definitely some Muslim communities who are really embracing these values as well. And I, and I will come to that in a bit, in the, uh, looking on more on the Berlin example. But here, gender is really one of the most important uh, debates here related also to secularism. Uh, one famous scholar, John Scott, actually coined the term secularism. He is saying that the free interpretation of sex and gender is actually very related to the secular values of the Western world. And here we will also in this course, we will look deeper on these different nuances of gender, gender discussions in Islam. Another big debate of Islam is actually uh, the debate of Islamic involvement of in public schools. So, meaning here, uh, teaching Islam as a subject in public schools for Muslim students, but also here the, to have, for example, or to allow Muslim individuals who are becoming or who are actually as a profession teachers, public school teachers, to wear the headscarf in front uh, of the class in a public school. The circumcision debate in Germany started with a court in Western Germany to rule that male circumcision is not allowed anymore as a practice in Germany. This caused a big, big, big debate also uh, uh, because the fact that not only the Muslim community abroad against this decision, but also the Jewish community, as in Judaism, circumcision is also part, a very important part of uh, uh, practice uh, and even within the first days of the life of a Jewish man. So what happened then is that there was a big discussion about the pro and cons of male circumcision, is the medical 
and religious practice in Germany. And at the end, Germany decided to do or issue a law which allows now May circumcision in Germany uh, for people of Jewish and Muslim belief. So there's a very big debate, and that is very related with the events of 9-11, with other terrorist attacks like in London in 2004, Madrid 2004, and then also, of course, um, uh, other terrorist attacks uh, in recent years. Um, it's the idea and the whole debate about Islam as a threat to security because the public, unfortunately, public picture of Islam is very, very transmitted as a violent religion. So in this course we will deal with the idea of Islam and look actually in what kind of debates and discourses suddenly Muslims are targeted as threat of security, as terrorists, but also here stress and really, really look on certain events where terrorist attacks were, uh, were actually done by Muslims. So governments in Western Europe attempt lately also to regu regulate Islam in Europe through various legislations, as I mentioned before, the headscarf ban, Booker ban, the minaret ban, and this, of course, these debates, these public debates, trigger also an inner Muslim debate on various ideas, interpretations, and representations of Islam within the Muslim community itself. So there are, of course, different ideas and opinions among a lot of Muslims regarding the veiling as a religious practice. For example, there are a lot of women who don't uh, even want to veil themselves. Some of them are still modest and basically take the modesty in their, or embody the modesty in their public appearance. But some of them are also very, very kind of keen not to wear the headscarf as a religious symbol. So now I come actually to the more concrete example again of Berlin with these public debates. And I will just basically mention these two public debates at the beginning, meaning the headscarf veiling and the construction of mosque as clear examples in Berlin. And what you can also find when you're coming here, um, how the dynamics actually are here regarding these debates. Regarding the headscarf veiling issue, Berlin has a unique law in Germany, it has the so-called Neutralitätsgesetz, the law of neutrality, which bans all religious symbols for people in public service, meaning teachers, lawyers, educators, university professors should not uh, wear religious any religious symbol. So I'm talking here not only about Muslims, I'm talking here also about people who are part of the Jewish or Christian belief. The headscarf debate was legislated in Germany since 2003 and is highly debated in each region. And Berlin actually have this Berlin's neutrality law uh, in this case, which is always challenged by various Muslim teachers trying to wear a headscarf in public schools. So the region is, or the law on this matter is always changing because a lot of Muslim individuals in the public service who want, for example, wear, and we are talking mostly about Muslim female individuals, who want to wear uh, the pub headscarf, for example, as a religious symbol uh, in uh, or as part of their appearance in the public, uh, they bring mostly these matters also in front of the Constitutional Court of Germany. So or in, about also among the uh, local and federal courts, uh, for example, in Berlin, and meaning that now each region has its own legislative power on this matter, and that even in 2018, this 
actually shifted now to the power to the public institutions itself. So the landscape of mosques in Berlin is very, very kind of differently composed. We have most worship rooms in Berlin are actually normal rooms in buildings, in normal buildings, which dysfunction to a mosque, so which kind of transform themselves to a mosque. But from the outside, they are basically just seen or appeared or even basically accessed as normal rooms, normal apartments maybe, or normal rooms in a building on a ground floor. So the construction of mosque means also, of course, a visible symbol in the landscape of Western Europe, but also in Berlin, to show that there is a visible worship place for Muslims in Berlin. So mosque constructions are here regulated by local authorities, and especially the high of the minarets, which you can see here on the picture of the Berlin main Berlin mosque, uh, the Schädlich mosque, is here that the height of minarets are even kind of debated and discussed. And just to note, the, these minarets are not even higher than a church tower. Yeah. So mosques, the mosque debate is not only uh, a debate about visibility, but it's also about a, a debate about conflict over territory. So whose territory is here challenged? Whose territory is here kind of marked? Or kind of also whose territory is here basically kind of publicly uh, defined when it comes to the new construction of mosques in Germany, in Berlin, but also in Western Europe. And at the end, what you can really find in Berlin, and now here kind of related to the title again, to multiculturalism, but also not, uh, but also to the ideas of secularism, cosmopolitanism, that there are different representations of Islam in Berlin. And you can really clearly see them in the form of the big Muslim organizations, which are here very pious, orthodox and represents a very kind of mainstream idea of Islam uh, and very kind of a stick to the traditions of Islam. But then you have find also secular liberal Muslim associations. Here very important that in Berlin, the first liberal mosque in Germany was actually founded uh, by one of a very pub, uh, important public figure, a, a Turkish Muslim feminist. And here it's important also that this mosque is representing the idea of a mosque being here a kind of no gender space in that sense that all genders are welcome, that female imams are preaching, and the idea also that here um, mainstream Islam is not here very, very welcomed in this mosque. Then you have a clear presence of LGBTQ Muslims associations in Berlin, where queerness, homosexuality, gender, transgender are kind of actually discussed and rethinked with Islam, uh, and here you can find new interpretations of Islam, kind of also make it more LGBTQ friendly for Muslims of this community who want also still like perceive their religion in the public sphere. In Berlin, we will find numerous communities where we will see a lot of converts to Islam, meaning here ethnically, biologically Germans converting to Islam and here be choosing themselves actually being a minority in the minority, 
so because the Muslim population is of course also a minority. Islam belongs to the minority religions of Germany and Europe and converts here choose to become a minority within the minority because they are very easily visible as converts because of their ethnic ethnicity but also of their race um, and uh, chose actually to become part of this community. As I mentioned also at the beginning, we have different sects of Islam. And one of the most important sects in Islam are these mystical Islamic sects, mystical Islamic groups, uh, very devoted to the mystical branch of Islam, namely Sufism. Uh, these dervishes, the dancing, whirling dervishes you have maybe here, and you can see here in this picture, is for example one of the most iconic pictures or images you have of mystical branches of Islam. In Berlin, you will find, again, here is a transnational kind of uh, connection, is that you will find a lot of mystical Islamic groups which are low, uh, tied to transnational uh, communities in Turkey, in Sudan, but also maybe in India. So here are the mystical Islamic groups, which are also not very present in the public sphere. So they are very, very undercover, but they give actually an idea here also that Islamic life is very different. Now coming here back to the title and to the idea that we deal here with Berlin as a cosmopolitan city because we have different cultures, we have different multi nationalities, we have different ethics, different values, and Islam is actually kind of trying and managing to integrate itself in this multicultural Berlin. And my course actually gives you here a very good overview, and this presentation hopefully gave a good overview of Berlin as a multicultural site when it comes to study Islam in Germany, but also in Europe, and I would just be welcome if prospective students choose my course. We will not only discuss these theoretical assumptions of secularism, cosmopolitanism, orientalism, or multiculturalism. We will also look deeply on these different case studies I now kind of try to sketch in this presentation, but also we will do different excursions and we will deal with the new discussions on Islam, maybe during the refugee movement, but also new discussions when it comes to new interpretations of Islam, of when it comes to the new interpretations of Islam regarding to gender, homosexuality, but also secularism and liberalism within Islam. But we will also look how Muslim organizations try to, and also Muslims in general in Berlin and in Germany, try to embody themselves and practice, religiously practice their religion in a multicultural Berlin. Thank you very much for listening to me, and I really hope uh, to see in near future physically, uh, most of you taking my course within the Afrobest program. Thank you very much. We hope you enjoyed this week's lecture. You can find the dates and descriptions for all sessions in our digital lecture series, as well as information about our instructors and their courses on our website. Also connect with us on social media and attend one of our informational webinars. Thank you very much for watching and we hope to see you again soon, online or on site here in Berlin.